All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a webinar Monday here in Studio Q. Uh, webinar Monday it doesn't sound the same as Webinar Wednesday. I'm so used to that just rolling <laughs> off my tongue. Um, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, we've got an exciting webinar today on the on the neuroscience of conflict, um, and I'm gonna going to assume. The reason you joined is because you learned so much from the neuroscience of gratitude with both of our wonderful presenters. So uh, we did that a few months back and uh, we hope you hope you joined. And if not, reach out to me and we can send you the recording on that. So um, just a quick reminder that there will be no CEU credit given um, for this presentation. Um, and I know you know that because you've read the description and join anyways, just to hang out and learn a little bit. So I'm um, trying to see the number of people we have joined with us today. Looks like we got 60 people on with us right now, 59. Um, so we appreciate y'all taking the time to join us on Thanksgiving week. Uh, we enjoy giving these, these presentations and then we hope that you, that you learn a little bit. So just to step back, um, I always think it's important to give you guys, um, kind of a, a look into why we think that this topic is important, um, especially for this audience. So primarily 80 to 90% of everyone that's on typically for our webinars um, is in the work comp industry. Um, and the remaining is uh, percent is mixed professions in the medical field. Um, and now let's acknowledge that, that those industries can have quite a bit of conflict both internally and externally uh, that impacts your day to day. Uh, and this pre in this presentation, uh, we'll teach you that what happens in your brain during conflict, uh, as well as proven best practices for navigating intellectual and creative differences, which we know, um, especially here at QI, based on our culture, uh, that those can, can help you both on your personal and professional lives. So joining me today are two leading experts in the science of building better brains and better workplaces. I've got QI's president and CEO, CEO, Patricia Kearns, and director of neuropsychology, Dr. Jeffrey Snell. So Jeff, I'm going to start with you. I always start with you just because uh, you don't like to be introduced for very long. So it's short, sweet, um, and then you kind of, you move on. So um, you've well, been- Go ahead, get a couple of cheap <laughs> shots in, get your start. There you go. Uh, you've been at QI now 22 years. Yeah, just uh, over 22. Came here as an intern in 1998 and was fortunate enough to be offered a position. And this is a fantastic place to work. So I've never had to go out and look for another job in the meantime. There it is. I think wrapped up for the day. That was it right there. <laughs> um, and then, and Pat, this is your second time in Studio Q for a, a webinar. You're in here all the time giving presentations, but for, for this audience and for this purposes, this is your second time joining us. And I appreciate you hopping back in the studio with me this morning. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Uh, 10 years as a practicing clinician, and then 10, you've got, you're on 20 years now. So 10 years now as the CEO, right? Or That's coming correct. up on? Yeah, coming up on. Okay. Yep. Um, extremely influential in developing our clinical program, as well as what everyone's going to hear about today, um, a driving force in cultivating the culture that we have at QLI. So um, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm a physical therapist by background, and as Tim said, had a chance to be part of QLI's uh, incredible clinical program for a decade. And was lucky enough when our brilliant founding CEO decided to, to step down, lucky enough to take on this role. So it's been uh, quite a joy to be part of this group for nearly 20 years. January 1st will be 20 years for me. And uh, I've learned a lot along the way, including uh, about how to manage conflict really well. Not something I, I knew coming in, um, but definitely glad I've, I've learned it along the way and excited to share today. Absolutely. And so if you don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to share a quick story. Okay. Um, so my introduction to QLI was at uh, the Young Professionals Summit. It would have been 2015. Um, and there was this crazy guy talking about a presentation called Take This Job and Love It, mm -hmm. uh, who I've now uh, come to know as our Director of Creativity, John Pearson. Um, and the reason I tell the story is uh, the... The premise, so there was a, a, a part of that presentation really made me realize the importance of conflict and how healthy it can be. Um, he gave a story or talked about how growing up, um, you're on, if you played sports, you'd be on a sports team and your coach can tell you, you you're doing a bad job. You're not doing very good. You, you need to practice more. You do all those things. And you take that um, as a team player, as I need to be better. I need to work on this. Please coach mm -hmm. me. I, I want to learn more. I want to be um, a driving force on my team and, and help us reach a goal. But so often I was in a, a management position um, in my past life. And any of those conversations that you had in a professional setting turned quickly to like interpersonal conflict, right? You were trying to coach somebody and it was like, oh, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, presented correctly, I'm sure I was young in my, my management career as well. So maybe I wasn't presenting it correctly. Um, but I, it just really resonated with me on this, this concept of once you get into a professional career, um, 
any type of coaching or conflict is perceived as always negative, mm -hmm. um, negative, never positive. So uh, that was my first introduction. And I, I left that young professional summit, went home, talked to my wife, and I was like, I need to work for QLI. That was the first thing I said. Um, and secondly, at least a company that has a culture like QLI. So right. um, which wrapping it all together, that's why I think that the work comp industry as a whole can benefit from this because there's a lot of uh, great takeaways. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass yeah. them up over to you guys. So Absolutely. Well, thanks everybody for being here. I realized that we did the neuroscience of gratitude a couple months ago. Um, so let me start by saying we're grateful this week of Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thankful for all of you. So, and uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, those of you that attended both to, to talk about conflict. So as Tim said, conflict is an important part of QLI's culture, uh, which may sound a little strange to everybody. We're all nice people and we like each other and we get along as well. But the reason that conflict is important is because there is no progress without conflict. And today we're specifically going to talk about healthy intellectual conflict, conflict that's targeted at ideas or situations. The pursuit of excellence requires growth or change and change is conflict. And if we resist change or re resist a diversity of thought that creates change, then there's only mediocrity. So no intellectual conflict, no excellence, or as our founding CEO used to say, conflict is the price we pay for excellence. So now I'm guessing that most of you, when you think of the word conflict, progress and excellence are probably not the first words that pop into your mind. So if everybody who's joined us today would open your chat box really quickly and type in a word or two that comes to mind for you when you think about the word conflict. And be honest. <laughs> if you say progress and excellence, great. Um, but I'm guessing uh, that's not always the case. Very good. All right. Yeah. So we've got, I'm going to leave this one close to here, but I'll read them on my side here, okay. Pat. Um, a lot actually coming through. So we've got vulnerability, stress, upsetting, toxic, pain, uncomfortable, overcoming, hostility, uh, growth. We had growth, stressful, difficult, disagree, opportunity, challenge, resolution, obstacle anxiety inducing, avoid, tension, uh, difference in opinion, uncomfortable, stress, anxiety, uncomfortable again, uh, one-sided, which is uh, an interesting take on it. Yeah, for absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. So I was visiting with a really new group of QLI team members recently about managing conflict. And when I asked them this question pretty consistently out of the group, uh, came a negative emotion, anxious or scared, or I think one of the young ladies said, like, I want to throw up. Uh, and when I started at QLI, if you asked me how I felt about conflict or what came to mind, those would have probably been my emotions as well. So as neuroplasticians, we know that we are not born disliking conflict. So um, as young children, we aren't born thinking, oh my gosh, conflict is bad but we're typically exposed over our lifetime to an abundance of what's the opposite of healthy intellectual conflict. We're typically exposed to emotional conflict that's directed at people. And of course that emotional conflict is unhealthy and unproductive and what elicits those emotions, all of those negative emotions. Now we're typically much less frequently exposed to healthy intellectual conflict targeted at ideas or situations. So Tim, your example of being on a sports team, right? We all have a common goal to win the game and the conflict from that coach is not personal. Um, it's really about skill sets or about play on the court. Um, so if you had that experience, that's amazing. That's super healthy, but most people don't necessarily have that experience or have an abundance of that experience. So if you think about maybe how you experience conflict growing up, whether that was aggressive or maybe the avoidance of conflict, neither of which are healthy, and how you continue to experience conflict at home um, or at work or in the media or social media that you choose to consume, we're often left associating negative uh, thoughts with conflict. And of course, 2020 has been quite a year filled with more conflict, I think, than usual. And you usually only have to either turn on your TV or open your favorite social media platform to see an abundance of examples that really reinforce your negative feelings about conflict. So after years of repetitive exposure uh, to engaging in emotional conflict, our brains over time become wired not only to associate conflict with negative feelings, but to respond to conflict in a negative way. So we get lots of wiring 
about negative, about conflict, um, both in how we perceive it and how we respond to it. And then on the flip side of that, if we don't have consistent modeling of how to navigate healthy intellectual conflict, we also end up deprived of the support and the repetition that our brains need to develop these productive skill sets. So lots of repetition on the, the negative side of conflict, not enough repetition on the positive healthy intellectual conflict uh, side of things. And then in addition to that, and Jeff's gonna talk about this in a moment, our brains uh, as we get older have the tendency to work against us when conflict arises. So all of that sounds like really bad news, I know, but believe it or not, and our goal is to have you believe this at the end of today's discussion, we can learn to view conflict as good, maybe even exciting. That's where I'm at. I think conflict is exciting. We can learn to view conflict as good and exciting if we are willing to separate negative emotional conflict from healthy intellectual conflict, if we can separate the two. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can talk to us a little bit about why our brains perceive conflict as negative. Well, thank you very much, Pat. Um, you know, with the last uh, Neuroscience Health presentation, we really took things at a cellular level, talking about the neurotransmitters that were involved. We're gonna bump it up a few different levels for this one and for this discussion, we're gonna talk more about how our brains process information, how we automatically make decisions and process information coming in, and then how that results in our thoughts, our actions, and our behaviors. So Pat, like you said earlier, change involves conflict and we are constantly faced with change. In order to understand why dealing with conflict or conflictual situations can be difficult, I wanna bring in some information about how our brains, our minds, process information and the role that our learning history plays in how we anticipate and respond to conflict. We don't just react to the world around us. We think we do, but there's an even stronger influence on our reactions that's a deeply buried set of beliefs or assumptions that guide our decision-making. These internal core beliefs operate at a subconscious level, and from these core beliefs, combined with our external situation and information, arise our conscious thoughts. Now, again, it has a positive effect because with every situation that we encounter, we're able to use that information that we have stored deeply within our brain to quickly filter and process information and make decisions. You don't have to start every decision-making process with a blank slate. You can use the benefit of your experience. But as that information passes through this filter of core beliefs, it can also result in biases and expectations that color our thoughts and our feelings and our actions. So at the heart of it, it's not reality, it's not truth to which we react, but it's our internal beliefs that shape what we perceive as reality and as truth. Our automatic thoughts allow for tremendous efficiency of cognitive processing from the wealth of information we have streaming in at any given point. As a point of neuroplasticity, they represent the overlearned information with which we've been surrounded throughout our lifetime, our experiences, and our knowledge. Rather than facing every situation as completely new and having to problem solve through it, we bring our collective understanding of the world with us. Not only our experiences, but the information that we've been told by others, the experiences we've observed from others. This allows for a very rapid and efficient processing of information, but like I said, it can also bring unhelpful assumptions that negatively influence our thoughts and actions. As a psychologist, I'm interested in uncovering those internal belief systems to build and encourage those that are supportive and helpful, and to challenge or change those that aren't. These core beliefs, as I mentioned, can be helpful in terms of quickly categorizing or working through problems, of understanding familiar or new information, but from a negative perspective, these core beliefs can also result in bias, in distortions of reality, and in unhelpful assumptions. The internal core beliefs that are unhelpful, core beliefs that don't align with reality, they're based on assumptions rather than facts. We refer to those unhelpful internal belief sets as cognitive distortions. Just like a lens you look through that gives you a distorted view of a scene, these internal beliefs can distort our perception of reality, causing us to react or think in a way that isn't helpful or that isn't well aligned with reality. There are three major categories or classes of cognitive distortions that result from these core beliefs. A distorted view of the self, 
I'm a failure. I am worthless. I am unlovable. Basing your self-worth on the opinions of others or even one step beyond that on what you perceive to be the opinions of others. There's also a distorted view of the world, assumptions of others' actions, assumptions of others' thoughts and feelings, and misconceptions of what others are thinking, intending, or meaning. We often make assumptions on what other people are thinking or feeling on the basis of what we observe, and then we react as if we absolutely know what that person is thinking or feeling. That can get you into trouble because if you're not aware of it, you're reacting to what you're thinking. You can't truly know what the other person is thinking. In a case like this, I'll tell you now, you are terrible at mind reading, but it doesn't stop you from acting as if you aren't. That distorted view of the world can also be conceptualized as a distorted view of the broader environment in which we exist. A distorted view of the future is one that's a little bit more self-explanatory. It's an internally held belief that things are always going to be the way they are now, a fallacy of permanence. Despite living in a world where things are constantly changing, we somehow want to hold on to the idea that things will always be the same, even when they aren't that great. It's something that with the residents and patients that we are working with at QLI um, is a really serious um, false belief that this point in your life where you're having some of what are likely the biggest struggles you've ever had to deal with, that things are always going to be this way, that things are never going to change. Things change. They have and they will. An example of the distorted view of the self and how that can influence our thoughts. Um, if everybody doesn't like me, then I'm no good. Uh, what, you're, what you're doing with each of these assumptions is you're putting your feelings into the hands of someone else. You're passing along control for how you feel about yourself to not just what you're told by others, but what you also assume by others. As you can see, such thoughts can be crippling when it comes to leadership because it's really rare that any single decision is gonna be met with universal approval, that everybody will be happy with every decision that you make. That leads to decisional paralysis if you cannot make a decision because you can't make everybody happy. If you think of conflict as an adversarial interaction, for example, that you and at least one other person disagree about something, then this cognitive distortion can make you question your own self-worth because of that lack of approval inherent in disagreement. If your self-worth is predicated on the approval of others and you suffer from the cognitive distortion that your self-worth is outside of your own control, then you're likely to avoid conflict at all costs. So this particular cognitive distortion is often at the heart of aversion to conflict. It's the personalization that Pat mentioned earlier. An example of the distorted view of the world. Things should happen the way I expect when I expect them. The world should treat me the way I want to be treated. Again, you know, the older you get, the more experience you have, you would think that this expectation would go away, but we still hold on to it. If anything, this year has called into question our beliefs regarding the predictability of the world. We live in a very dynamic world where things are constantly changing, and those changes are often unpredictable based on our past experiences. Our challenge is to identify what we have the power to change and what we need to do differently to adapt to those situations that we cannot change. In truth, the world truly doesn't take our feelings into consideration. What we want and what we expect to be predictable and controllable doesn't really line up with reality. That last point on the slide, if I don't get what I want, it's terrible and I can't stand it. Well, we often don't get what we want. We think it would be nice if we did, but we survive. We shouldn't catastrophize or overreact to those instances in which reality reminds us that the world is relatively oblivious to what we want and what we expect. If you think about it, actually, a lot of, uh, a lot of tales and stories illustrate the dangers of everybody getting what they want when they want it. It's not necessarily the best thing. Catastrophizing is wasted effort, and it's energy that does nothing to foster change or adaptation. Again, our role from an adaptive standpoint is to change in ways that best match the reality in those cases where it's beyond our ability to change the world to our liking. 
Because the world in which we live typically doesn't exist in absolutes, we often waste valuable time, effort, and resources trying to control that which is beyond our control. We become emotionally invested and we react to situations that are beyond our control and that lessens our ability to act effectively. I'm not saying you should give up and just accept everything, but a more reasoned and analytic, analytical perspective of changing what is within your power and ability to change, but not expending effort fighting against things that cannot be changed. Our irrational thoughts result in us setting expectations that are impossible to achieve and expectations of ourselves and others that set us up to be disappointed, that set us up for failure because they're beyond our ability to achieve. Such thoughts are relatively easy to challenge because we can recognize that they're impossible. But, and this is the harder part, they are really, really difficult to change because these are deeply held beliefs that we have carried with us forever. Even when we actively become aware of these irrational thoughts and their impact on us, those thoughts are still there. It takes a lot of time to practice, first off, being aware of them, and then to practice changing them. That's the good thing, though. They can be changed. There are a host of end results from these irrational thoughts that result from our cognitive distortions, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list of them. But if you look through these, you can probably find a few that are your favorites. We all kind of have our, our own oldies and goldies that we hang on to. These provide reasons and rationalizations for our thoughts and our actions based on assumptions that don't fit reality. Let me point out just a couple. Selective attention. We tend to seize on things that support our expectation or belief, and we discount those that contradict our worldview. This is like cherry picking facts that support our belief and discounting those that don't align with our hypothesis. And catastrophizing. Good God, we are all experts at this. Take a little piece of information of an event and extend it right out to the horizon. This also involves a sense of perspective. If everything in your life is going really well, a little minor inconvenience can be perceived as a major catastrophe. It generally takes a personal experience of substantial dimensions to change that perspective. Your perception of what is a disaster changes when you encounter a bigger disaster. Sometimes we're so in the weeds in a particular issue that we fail to see the bigger picture. The context makes a difference in how we interpret a conflict. And we need to keep that bigger picture and perspective in mind because that generally is a little bit more aligned with the reality of the situation. So, if you've never been aware of the fact that you filter your experiences and external information coming in through all those filters in your internal core beliefs, the next question becomes, how can I change them? I mean, how did they get there to begin with? Through our experiences, through our expectations. We change them as well through our conscious awareness and through practice. Neuroplasticity involves practice and repetition, and this is no different because it's changing a process within our brain. First awareness, then practice, repetition, and conscious assessment of our thought processes, and the degree to which we are reacting to our own internal thoughts are the way the world truly is. And we do this through science, through experimenting, through experiencing, through practicing. We want to challenge and change those irrational thought processes through practice. From a neurological perspective, we call this neuroplasticity. It's a learning process just like any other. Changing our brains to more efficiently run routines through practice and repetition, and specifically to do so with internal beliefs that better align with reality. This is generally accomplished through our own direct experiences, but we're capable, if we're open to it, to learning through the examples and experiences of others. So, be aware of the role of your thoughts and emotions in responding to a situation, especially a situation that you're anticipating is going to be a negative experience, because conflict generally has that negative connotation. Almost all of the responses that you put into the chat box to Pat's questions earlier would be words that you would typically have a negative association with. So, Pat, Give us a little information on what to do about this. Absolutely. So before we do that, I'm going to acknowledge that one of my irrational thought patterns is around perfectionism. 
that I feel like I have to be perfect at everything. And if I'm not perfect, then that's a sign of failure. So when I started at QLI 20 years ago, if somebody offered an idea that was different than mine or offered me um, coaching on something I could do differently or do better, I took that really hard because that perfectionism um, irrational thought pattern was my filter. Um, and so thankfully though, after 20 years of being surrounded by people who have absolutely no problem telling me on a regular basis that I'm not perfect or uh, there might be an idea or two or 10 better than mine out there. I've had a lot of repetition of, again, that, that irrational thought pattern to your point, Jeff, hasn't gone away, um, but I have a much better routine of managing um, those irrational thoughts and, and overcoming them with more, more positive thoughts. So that, you know, you meant what you're mentioning there, I think also fits well with what Tim said um, earlier that uh, that perfectionism is a big piece of it. And on a, in a team setting where you have a coach that's helping you, you know, the best quarterback in the world doesn't complete every pass. Uh, the best running back doesn't get a first down every time. Um, so it is that you're not going to be perfect in whatever it is that you do. So I think that's a really good example of, of that distorted thought process that can kind of hamstring you and make you feel bad about just normal, you know, the, the things that you're never going to be perfect. No one is. <laughs> yes, I've learned that well, like I said. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so at QLI, I, you know, obviously we talk about conflict a lot and uh, spend a lot of time trying to help our team members create a routine of believing that conflict can be good and overcoming whatever their rational thought patterns are so that um, all of us can anticipate a positive experience around conflict. And so again, our goal is the same for you here today uh, because we find that the better your skill sets are around conflict, the better the outcome and the better you feel about it, the easier it is to get into a routine of, of anticipating a positive experience. So I'm gonna share today with you a really relatively simple mental checklist that I go through each time I'm presented with, or maybe, um, that I need to initiate conflict. So whether it's coming to me or I need to initiate conflict, this is the, the checklist I go through. And it's a quick checklist that not only provides me a framework for how to work through the conflict, but I found it really helps me keep conflict at the intellectual level and helps me avoid letting my emotions make it personal. So if you attended the Neuroscience of Gratitude discussion, we went through in that presentation, the five components of learning a routine. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on those today, Certainly we can talk about them if anybody has questions, but, um, but with this mental checklist, you do need to apply the components of learning um, so that this checklist um, won't be so clunky at the beginning and it really can be more automatic. Again, when visiting with some of our new team members, they look at this checklist, even though it's super simple and think, oh my gosh, who does this checklist? But again, with some repetition, this can be really become a really automatic just part um, of your routine as you're presented with conflict. So, um, so as you think about this checklist, make sure you um, going through the components of learning really quickly, find your motivation, push yourself outside of your comfort zone to practice these uh, six steps uh, in contextual or real life situations. Make sure you have some support, um, whether that's uh, a coach, somebody who's helping keep you accountable um, or written information, uh, things like that, but make sure you have support to, to create success and that you get lots of repetition. And again, it might feel a little clunky at first, but they will be eventually become automatic if you put some effort into them and you won't even realize that you're, you're going through these uh, six steps uh, when conflict come your way. And some of you may already have a routine built in for at least some of these steps that, that you do without thinking about them. So my six step mental checklist starts with thinking through if conflict comes to you or you need to initiate it, what is your intent around the conflict? So the first step at managing your irrational thought patterns is your intent, and it should be, to make this situation better um, or to help this individual. Is your intent to make the situation better um, or help this person get better? Or is your intent around um, that you need to be right or um, that you crave justice on something, that you want to get revenge on something. So are you frustrated? Think about your emotions with that. So again, is it truly to make the situation or person better or is it some other intent? So once you really have clarity on your intent and have yourself in a good spot, who's the audience? You need to think a little bit about who are you going to have conflict with? What's your relationship with them? Do you have a strong relationship or do you barely know each other? Maybe what is their view of conflict? Have they had any positive experiences with conflict? or are they gonna to tend to be a little resistive to the conflict? 
and what's their level of confidence as well. So if you do tend to be a supervisor or manager for that individual, just the difference in titles may lower their confidence a bit. Um, and it's good to know all of that as you're going in to the conflict so that you can adjust your style. The third step, um, these two and third and fourth steps get a little more complicated, but the third step is assessing. And again, over time, you can learn to do this very quickly, but what is the focus of the conflict? Are you talking about facts? And we'll go over resolution techniques next. Is this methods, how we're going to get something done? Is it goals conflict, actually a step back from methods on do we have an agreed upon uh, vision or direction that we're going? Or is it values-based conflict? And sometimes there can be multiple areas of these happening within a conflict. Or sometimes we can think something's a fact just because I, as a leader in the company, think it's a fact. That may not necessarily be true. So you really have to think about what's the focus of the conflict or their multiple focuses of the conflict. And then with that, in step number four, what's the appropriate resolution technique? So if the conflict is simply around a fact, like my husband and I arguing over dinner about who is the artist playing this song, um, that is a fact. You can use authority like Google um, or it can be directed. So if it's fact-based conflict, authority or directing. If it's methods conflict, you can use compromise or collaboration. Um, and I'm gonna jump to goals and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between compromise or collaboration. If it's goals-based conflict, you really want to use collaboration. And I'll pause here and say that collaboration is the hardest resolution technique. Most people think they're collaborating when they're working together, um, but what they're probably doing is compromising. So you have to evaluate in that process. Are we pushing each other and having intellectual conflict through collaboration to get to the best idea? So building on each other's ideas which may look like that's not a very good idea, but here's another idea. That's not a very good idea. Here's another idea, but pushing each other really to get the, to the very best possible idea, or are each of you giving up something um, to get to a lesser idea, which would be compromising. So usually you're setting goals before you're talking about now methods, right? How are we going to get there? What are we going to agree that we want to get done versus how are we going to make that happen? And so if you can step back and really push each other and have conflict, with nobody taking offense to their idea not being the very best idea, you can collaborate effectively to get to the best possible goal. And then whether you collaborate or need to compromise a bit to, to work through the methods of how you're gonna get there, it's gonna be okay. I always think about this with the legislature. So as we're preparing, preparing for the next legislative session here in Nebraska um, and coming off a really tough legislative session, um, you know, what we see those legislators often do is end up compromising over goals. And so instead of ending up with the best possible goal, everything's been worked down in order just to make something happen. And then by the time you figure out how you're going to get there from a method standpoint, everything's just really muddied up, um, which is hard. So, but with collaboration, you know, that really requires people on both sides of the conflict um, to be willing to collaborate. So if somebody wants to use authority around goals and the other person's trying to collaborate, that's never gonna work out because it really, collaboration is such a hard resolution technique. Both people have to have that mindset around positive, healthy intellectual conflict and willing to be willing to participate in that. So the fourth uh, or the next resolution techniques are around values. So typically around values, uh, we always hear, right, don't talk about politics and religion, you know, when you're uh, in a social setting. And so we tend a lot of times around values-based conflict to uh, avoid that conversation. And that, that's probably appropriate sometimes, especially if you don't have the skill sets around it. Uh, the other option for values-based conflict can be structural modification. So this is what you see when we have a team member that maybe gets terminated or, or resigns from the company. We didn't align in our values between the company and that individual. And so parting ways is the best option, or maybe through a divorce would be something that you would think of from a structural modification around values. The other option, um, the other resolution technique for values-based conversation, and this is something our team has really been pushed on this year, um, as we've had to navigate like everybody, um, challenges around the pandemic or around the civil unrest. But uh, we decided as a team that, you know, avoiding conflict doesn't solve any problems. You know, we all have to work together. So structural modification is also not the, uh, an option or the healthiest process for us. And so the other option for um, resolving conflict that we have found helpful is simply to seek understanding. So to listen, not necessarily for the sake that you're all trying to agree on something, but at least that you can understand the values and the viewpoints 
of the person across the table from you. And if we're willing to seek understanding, really truly listen for not for understanding and not listen just to, to get a good rebuttal in, um, again, we may not come to terms on values, but at least we can work through the ugly conflict that can happen around values. So again, facts, method, goals, and values, and then those are the resolution techniques. Step three and step four are probably the ones that take a little more practice for this to get automatic. So when conflict comes at you, can you in 60 seconds or less identify what the focus of the conflict is and what the best resolution te te technique is? Um, sometimes you have more than 60 seconds to make that decision, but sometimes you have to make some quick decisions and, and this can be learned with some repetition. So step number five then um, is back to the who, and this time it's considering are you the best person to respond to the conflict? So sometimes I recognize that my title gets in the way. So back to step number two, if my audience is someone that I don't have a strong relationship with or their confidence isn't very good, and maybe they haven't had a lot of practice with positive, healthy, intellectual conflict, um, then just by the nature of my title, um, it may seem too heavy handed um, for me to be the person responding to that conflict. So I may go to one of their peers to suggest that um, they help work through that conflict. So are you the best person to do it or should you pull in somebody else um, with you or to handle that conflict instead of you? And then step number six uh, is always follow up. So even uh, when you have two people who are really seasoned and have good routines around positive, healthy, intellectual conflict, um, again, these irrational thought patterns that Jeff talked about still sometimes can creep back in. So um, I have found that no matter how well you think that conflict went, it's always in your best interest to follow up with that person and check in, make sure that the relationship is still strong, make sure everything that you said landed the right way um, and everybody feels good about the situation just so you can prevent any um, processing after the fact um, to allow emotions to creep in and for that to turn into personal conflict. So, so the six st uh, steps, what's your intent? Who's the audience? What's the focus of the conflict? What's the appropriate resolution technique based on the focus of the conflict? Are you the best person to respond? And always make sure you follow up. Okay, Tim, so that's my mental checklist. It's a lot, it's a lot to take in. I think um, to your point earlier, uh, the most important thing to remember about this is it is a skill and it's something that you can learn mm -hmm. with repetition. Um, so I think uh, looking at it, it can look daunting, but as long as you uh, put some repetition and put some time in, it's something that we all can get better at. If so, I can get better at it, anybody <laughs> can get better at it, Tim. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I do want to throw it out there. Uh, we have uh, Pat and Jeff here for a little bit longer. So uh, if you have any questions, the chat is open. Please chime in. Um, anything you want them to, to kind of dive in uh, to a little bit more. Um, one thing I wanted to, to ask, Jeff, you mentioned um, observed behavior <clears throat> of individuals maybe around you can impact maybe the negative um, reaction you have to conflict. Is that something that you think, um, I, th I know the answer to this, but does that start at a young age, right? So back to the team's analogy, right? So if you're on a team where no one really respects the coach or doesn't uh, receive coaching well, do you think that carries into your professional career later on, or later on in life? Um, is that something that um, is hard to break if, the, if maybe you grew up and you, you mentioned that early on of like your social settings, things that you learn early on, um, I, I just, the, the observation of conflict for me, um, reflecting on like, I had some teams that were just terrible at listening to a coach. Right. And that did, you could, you could see it in how the team performed, um, and how everyone, uh, got along with that authority figure. Um, so that was kind of my question. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, you want to take that? No, that's a great one. Um, uh, you know, that I think it's, certainly the case, Tim, because, you know, you act actively have to kind of teach and practice assumption of good intent mm -hmm. when you're going into any type of a conflictual situation. You know, we just automatically leap to, um, based on what we see someone else do, we automatically leap to mind reading and, and a negative assumption if uh, what they've done has put us out in any way or offended us in any way, uh, that there was negative intent involved there. And that's not always the case. Sure. Um, I think the best example that probably everybody has experienced within the last week is having, you know, somebody cut you off on the highway. Um, you automatically are now justified in your anger and road rage at that person, even though you have no capability 
of knowing why at that moment they changed lanes. It probably wasn't that they woke up that morning going, I'm going to figure out a way to piss this guy off today. It just, that's not the way the world works, but it's the way our minds tend to work. And so we actively have to interrupt that process and evaluate that. And oftentimes when you're emotionally heightened, it's not the right time to challenge that. When you're already upset and you're gripping the wheel, like you're about to tear it off the steering column, um, that's not the moment at which to kind of be emotionally detached and uh, be the scientist saying, why am I thinking this way at this moment? Uh, but if we could do that, we would have a lot less stress in our life because of those uh, lack of assumption of good intent or our poor mind reading skills that we engage in. For sure. I also wanted to chime in, Pat, you mentioned uh, using Google to, to solve your, your <laughs> singer. I still don't believe Google sometimes. Like I know I'm right. Uh, maybe there's a, a remix done or something, but I know I've heard it from this, audio, this artist compared to what my wife thinks. So. Oh, my Pat, says the same thing. <laughs> I've heard it. Pat, I've, I've, I've got a question for you if we don't have one in the chat box, and that is with that uh, number four on the mental checklist, that which yeah. resolution technique. You know, I'm guessing that like everything else in life and in the world, um, a conflictual situation isn't necessarily a clean one issue. You probably have several layers of things that you're looking at. How do you decide at any kind of given moment within that process, uh, which of those techniques should rise to the top? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Jeff. And I suppose it depends on the situation um, and who's involved, their experience with conflict and maybe uh, what in it, you know, in any given um, conversation, the overriding focus of the conflict is. So very often we see goals and values conflict really happening at the same time. So we may be trying to decide for um, an individual that we're serving at QLI, um, what, what are the goals of their program? And maybe that individual um, you know, comes from a different life situation than some of our team members involved are involved, right? And so it's so easy for us as human beings to start projecting our values on that situation and starting and and figuring out how do we how do we understand the individual we're serving and their values compared to our values so that we can really separate that first and then get back to goal setting. Or again, just even with, I, so me, I try not to pick on my husband too much, sorry, but it's, uh, let's say Jeremy and I are having conflict over something, right? And um, we're trying to decide uh, what a goal is for, um, for Carson's learning and education, right? But we both come from very different backgrounds. And so even though we're having goals related conflict, that our values start creeping into that process yeah. um, and really muddying that up. And so we realize at some point we have to step back and say, okay, we need to really understand each other's values so that we can truly get back to goals related conflict. And that is really, really hard to do. Um, you know, when you get further apart from having a relationship. So if you have two team members going through that same process, trying to set a goal around something um, and values conflict is creeping in and they don't have a super strong relationship, haven't worked together for a long time. Um, that gets really complicated, but you know, I, I think, at the end of the day, um, and this is what we try to teach our team members, that everything can be healthy intellectual conflict if you really put the effort into it. And so if something is turning into emotional conflict and personal conflict, everybody has to be accountable for hitting the pause button and stepping back and say, okay, why is this happening, right? Is it irrational thought patterns getting in the way? Are we maybe not on the right track as far as identifying what the focus of the conflict is? Is there more values conflict in here than we realize and we need to step back um, and really address um, this from a different perspective? So, um, so everybody just really has to be accountable to that process yep. to making it positive and, and healthy. So For it's kind sure. of a long answer to your question, Jeff, but you might have something else to add. No, I appreciate it. No, that's what I was wanting to know. <laughs> We do have a question that uh, that I'd love to respond to my part of it and hear yours as well. And that's uh, from Janet who said, are there good resources or books recommended regarding this topic? Um, from the standpoint of our irrational thoughts, I would say if you want to get on the web and look up something called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy or REBT, um, that is the 
the, the therapeutic approach designed at looking at and challenging these irrational beliefs. And you can find a lot of information on that on the web. Uh, the other would be cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, um, of which REBT is a subset. So that would be from a psychological standpoint, uh, some resources that I would recommend. And there are lots of books out there uh, published. Pat, how about uh, from conflict? What are some of the, the ones that really resonate with you? You know, there are, yeah, I mean, there are a number of, of books. Fierce Conversations is one that comes to mind. Um, there are a number of books around conflict and blanking on a couple of others. And I guess just from the standpoint that, that a lot of this is something that we've really just put the effort into developing at QLI, starting with Dr. K um, Hogeveen, Kim Hogeveen, our founding CEO, um, uh, with this process. And then again, continuing to develop it over time. So with an understanding of CBT and those irrational thought patterns, um, with the belief that, again, conflict can be intellectual targeted towards ideas or situations rather than emotional and targeted towards people working through this process um, over the course of, you know, I've been here 20 years, but QLI celebrated its 30th anniversary earlier this year, just working through this pro uh, process of figuring out um, how can we have conflict at a really fast pace and keep it intellectual. Um, it's been a work in progress over that time. Um, and then we did have uh, another question, which, uh, a fairly specific one, but I think would be uh, beneficial for the individual asking, as well as a lot of other uh, listeners to um, to listen to. So, um, Abby, I'm in a, a leadership position, and I have two employees that just can't seem to get along. They definitely struggle with expressing a seek-to-understand point of view. Um, how do you recommend I come at this from a leadership perspective when it starts to interfere with our culture? <laughs> <There's> <laughs> yes. A lot going on there. Yeah, there is, you know, and I, we've experienced that over time. You know, we have um, a non-negotiable expectation um, that people do have to uh, get to know each other and like and respect each other. I think, um, you know, even in earlier in QLI's history, um, and I see this at other organizations, my sister and I are having this conversation, I don't think it's the expectation at most work settings that you actually have to like each other. And so we give the example around here that, you know, if you, if you have a scale of zero to 10 and you think about the person in your life that you like the most, that you love, they're, they're your, your favorite person in the world. You can share all your deepest, darkest secrets with, trust them with anything. Um, they trust you with anything, that that person is a 10 on your, your zero to 10 scale. The rest of your team members at work, the people you work with on a regular basis, should be at least a seven on that scale, um, you know, compared to, to what your, your 10 is. And so that's a non-negotiable expectation that if we're going to work together and be able to have healthy intellectual conflict, that has to, or it goes better at least, if there's a strong foundation of liking and respecting each other. And so um, oftentimes we'll work through a process of setting aside the work topics, set aside the professional related topics, and we're just going to spend time personally getting to know each other. Do you know families, what you enjoy doing? Do you know what your fears are, what your dreams are? Um, I know that may sound a little hokey and, and soft, but um, making sure that there's time for that personal relationship building and then making sure the expectation is strong that if we're going to work together, we have to like each other. And it's possible if both sides are open to that. Um, it really is. Perfect. I think that was a fantastic answer for the, for the, it is. Pat, I think it also kind of addresses the, the mind reading piece of it, because if, as you get to know a person better, you get to know how they think, what they feel, what they value. And so you're not imposing your perception of what they're thinking. You're actually getting to hear what they think. Absolutely. I heard this analogy one time and it's, it's a little uh, somewhere. I don't remember where I heard it, but it's like, it, it was the analogy of concrete and concrete starts soft, squishy, so you start those conversations with that and it hardens into a very uh, substantial foundation. Um, so I think I, I take a lot of my um, approach to just personal relationships that way, especially on the professional side, right? You can quickly yeah. turn a personal relationship into a professional one if you have that personal understanding of who they are. Absolutely. Um, so I've always looked at it like that. So, yeah. Um, well, if we don't have any other questions, um, I think we will wrap up. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's what I've started. Setting Great. aside time to force them to get to know each other. It's a slow process, a slow process, but definitely worth the, the effort. Yeah, so great. Um, as always, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can either reach out to us at QLI webinars at QLI Omaha.com. Um, uh, we've had a few questions about if it's being recorded. Yes, it is. 
Uh, if you'd like a copy of that, feel, feel free to reach out to the, what, the email address that I just mentioned, QLI webinars at QLIOmaha.com or myself, tim.benock at QLIOmaha.com. Um, and I can share that here with you. Um, also, please always check us out on social media, uh, teamqli.com as well as qliomaha.com. If you guys have, um, you know, need any resources for um, maybe the, the residents that we serve, the population that we serve for brain injury, spinal cord injury, please, please check us out there. Um, and then the, the crazy guy, oh, there's the best picture. Yeah, we forgot to, to end it with the, the picture. Absolutely. Yeah. This, is, this is how we hope everybody yes. feels right now after talking about conflict, right? <laughs> Everybody's like, whoo. This is awesome. It is so crazy. <laughs> I, when I was looking at this, uh, when you sent it this weekend, uh, no masks. I'm I like, know. I miss it. I this miss is, it so much. I, should, I suppose you <laughs> qualify this as this was a pre-pandemic picture. Yes, so. absolutely. Uh, and shout out to Pat. We're in the same room. We're not able to socially distance. So she, we both have masks on. I've been talking the whole time. So shout out to you there. And uh, hopefully it didn't come across as us trying to catch our breath through a, through a, a mask. <laughs> but um, uh, please check us out uh, next week. Next month, we're going to be the crazy guy that I talked about at the Young Professional Summit, who I'm hurt sure a lot of you um, have heard speak. Uh, our Director of Creativity, John Pearson, will be um, giving a presentation on emotional recovery, which is always, um, we always save it till December just because it is a, a fantastic time of the year to, to really talk about that topic. So um, please join us for that. You'll be getting a, an invite shortly after this presentation. Um, and as always, we hope you have a great rest of the day and we look forward to you joining us next time. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes. And happy Thanksgiving. It is that week. Take care. <laughs>